Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at 6. There's been a sharp rise in the number of migrants trying to cross the channel by boat this year. More than 100 have managed the perilous journey from France to the Kent coast. This morning, 18 migrants in two small boats, including a baby, were stopped in the channel. In the last three weeks alone, boats have made it across the channel, carrying 110 migrants, many claiming to be Iranian nationals. All of them have been passed to immigration officials. The French police say they believe the recent surge in numbers is down to tighter security at Eurotunnel and also Brexit, with migrants wanting to get to the UK before it happens. Colin Campbell reports. Rescued off the coast of Dover in an inflatable dinghy. These are migrants from northern France trying to get to Britain. In the last few months, there's been a surge in this kind of activity. A migrant camp in Dunkirk we're secretly filming using an undercover researcher. It's smugglers like this man who are at the heart of the problem, willing to risk lives for financial gain. A boat that will cost you three to four thousand pounds. I'm picking three people with me. They pay in cash. We get a boat and off we go. He says he was a fisherman in Iran and getting us across the channel would be easy. Look, I will check the weather. You have waves in the sea, ferries cross the water, and they can drag you underneath them even if you're one kilometer away. But I know the sea routes where you will not be disrupted by the ferries. More than a hundred migrants have reached the Kent coast by boat in the last three weeks, but not all that depart succeed. Farhad from Afghanistan was put in a dinghy with 11 others. He was rescued at night after the engine stalled. He thought he was going to die. It was freezing a couple of days ago, and when you get wet, we were full wet. I was like that to myself. A couple of guys, they actually fainted, you know, they went, they fainted, they were sleeping and we were trying to wake him up. And they were, we were trying to wake him up because their hearts will stop from the cold. This migrant told me the boat he was in capsized after being battered by waves. Living in a squalid makeshift camp in Calais, they claim they fled their countries because of religious and political persecution. Their desperation to get to the UK is being fueled by fears of Brexit. How many of you think that it's going to get harder? Harder? Put your hands up. You all think, you all think it's going to get harder? There is a rush. Everybody's talking about it in here in the jungle. They're like that. We need to get in quicker, you know what I'm saying, in case the security gets tied up. Even as winter sets in and temperatures start to plummet here, migrants in this part of north of France are continuing to prepare to cross this treacherous stretch of water. It's happening at night time in the dark and they're using their mobile phones to navigate across to the Kent coast. Waiting to catch a dinghy to the UK, the Iranian migrants told me they paid £6,000 each and were waiting to be taken to a nearby beach by smugglers. <laughs> We have to go by boat. We know we are putting our life in danger. I've tried before, but the waves were three meters high and came up over the boat. I already stared death in the face. There are fears drowned migrants could wash up onto Calais beaches. Migrants trying to cross are risking their lives every night here in Calais. Is the French authorities uh, doing enough? Well, we try to stop them. Uh, we stopped quite every boat that tried to cross the channel, but we, we need to face the truth. The truth is we cannot stop everyone. Overloaded with migrants, this was the boat stopped by French authorities this morning. They were rescued, but there's real fear lives may soon be lost. Well, despite the influx of migrants here in Dover in small boats, in inflatable dinghies, it is in the back of a truck, in the back of a lorry, which remains the most popular and common way for migrants in northern France trying to get here to the UK. Now, one French politician told me last week that half of all of the trucks being inspected at the Channel Tunnel in France contain stowaways. The French authorities, they believe that it is improved security checks at the French ports, which is driving the smugglers to try to find new tactics, new ways of getting here to the UK, which is why they are perhaps sending migrants here in the small boats. Now, gales are forecast out in the channel. The conditions out there are likely to be much more hazardous over the next few days, which is why we're likely to see fewer boats, fewer migrants arriving here in Dover.
Colin Campbell, thank you. And viewers in the southeast of England can see more on this story on BBC Southeast Today, which follows this programme at half past six. A bus company involved in a fatal accident has been fined £2.3 million for allowing their tired driver to continue working despite concerns about his abilities. A Midland Red bus crashed in Coventry in 2015, killing a seven-year-old boy and a pensioner. The trial heard that Kailash Chanda, who was then 77, had mistaken the accelerator for the brake. Seema Katecha reports. It was a bus journey that went terribly wrong and cost two people their lives. Behind the wheel was 77-year-old Kailesh Chanda, a driver who lost control as he pulled out from a bus stop and ploughed into a Sainsbury's store. Today, his former employer, Midland Red, was fined £2.3 million after admitting failing to prevent the accident by monitoring the driver's performance and tiredness. Our own detail policies were not followed as closely as they should have been. There were failures at an operational level in driver supervision and we deeply regret the opportunities that were missed to act decisively on emerging warning signs. The court was told how on numerous occasions the company had been alerted to Mr Chuck's problematic driving and had failed to respond. Midland Red had received several complaints from passengers about his driving. A driver assessment system installed on buses consistently scored his performance as poor. And just 48 hours before the crash, one of his managers had warned that he was not safe and that the company should consider ending his contract. The judge, Paul Farrer QC, said that Midland Red had deliberately disregarded the evidence because of staff shortages. He said Mr Chanda, who had been judged medically unfit to stand trial, had worked more than 70 hours in some weeks prior to the accident. 76-year-old Dora Hancocks and 7-year-old Rowan Fitzgerald were killed in the crash. Today, Rowan's family said Mr Chanda should have known he posed a risk and Midland Red was equally to blame for the cruel way in which the child died. Seema Katecha, BBC News, Birmingham. The Prime Minister has begun trying to sell her Brexit deal to the public on a whirlwind tour of Wales and Northern Ireland against a backdrop of continuing criticism, the latest from the likes of President Trump to senior figures in her own party, as well as the DUP leader Arlene Foster, who today said Theresa May had given up on getting a better Brexit deal. One of the most controversial parts of the deal is the so-called backstop to ensure an open border on the island of Ireland in the event that the UK leaves the EU without securing an all-encompassing deal. It would involve a temporary single custom territory, effectively keeping the whole of the UK in the EU customs union until both the EU and the UK agree it's no longer necessary. Northern Ireland would also stay aligned to some EU single market rules. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports from Belfast. The start of another working day. The hardest job in Brexit has been working out what happens here. In Belfast, as in Parliament, maybe the only thing everyone feels is frustration. I think people are sort of getting fed up with it. A lot of people are going to be afraid now, more than we ever were. Uh, but you just have to get on with it. Afraid of what? Well, afraid of a hard border because it's been talked about. I don't think it'll happen. Afraid of are they going to be left out on their own or different part of the UK? Just had enough. I don't think anyone knows what's happening there. Honestly. The Prime Minister's working day just gets harder. Controversy everywhere. Here, trying to sell her economic compromise and the so called backstop, where if there's no big trade deal with the EU in future, Northern Ireland would be more closely bound to the EU than the rest of the country. She knows it's unpopular. Hear her laughing about being written off. Then back to the script. People don't want to go back to uncertainty and division, and it's that uncertainty and division that would happen if uh, people didn't, if the Parliament does not support this deal. The boss here is far from the only one who's with her, desperate for that agreement to be signed off. Not because it's perfect, but because it's something better than this unsteady situation he believes is costing jobs. 
we need a deal and there's only one deal on the table. I just can't reconcile the reality of what we face with the positions being taken by politicians UK wide. I didn't see a no deal Brexit on the side of a bus um, and I certainly can't reposition our industry in the space of four months. They need to face up to the reality and stop spinning the illusions of what it means. But all political sides are stubborn. The supposed Northern Irish allies of the Prime Minister are furious that her compromise could see Northern Ireland more tightly tied to the EU. Instead of wasting the next two weeks trying to persuade everybody that this is the only deal, therefore we must accept it. I mean, my goodness, what sort of a, a propaganda route is that? This is it. This is as good as it gets, so we have to accept it. The Prime Minister has given up, and she's saying this is where we are, and we just have to accept that. But she may have given up on further negotiations and trying to find a better deal, but I haven't given up. She would say she's done anything but given up. What she's trying to do is actually get something done that is realistic rather than spend another two years talking about what might be. Why do we need to have the backstop in the withdrawal agreement? It's time to get rid of it and to try to find a better deal. What happens here in Northern Ireland has been the biggest Brexit conundrum all along. And the Prime Minister's solution to the problem around the Irish border is precisely what has turned so many of her natural allies against her. And right now, there is precious little sign of any of them being willing to budge at all. The Prime Minister might find refuge in crowds today in Wales as well as across the Irish Sea. But it's Parliament's decision and many MPs think the deal's doomed. It might take more than handshakes to shift them. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Belfast. Meanwhile, Nicola Sturgeon says Theresa May's Brexit deal is quite simply a bad deal and would make Scotland £9 billion poorer by 2030. The First Minister was quoting from new research produced by the Scottish Government's economic advisers. The SNP's 35 MPs will all vote against the withdrawal agreement. Our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, joins me now. So why will Scotland be so much poorer then? Well, Nicola Sturgeon's worried about the ease with which Scottish companies can trade with the EU and also about their ability to recruit staff after Brexit. And these Scottish government figures suggest that leaving the EU under the Prime Minister's deal could do such damage to the economy that it would cost £1,600 per person in Scotland by 2030. And Nicola Sturgeon's also worried about that Northern Ireland backstop because she says if it's activated it could put Scotland at a competitive disadvantage with Northern Ireland because they would have a closer relationship with the EU. Ms Sturgeon is worried that actually Northern Ireland could benefit from jobs and investment that Scotland might miss out on. So the SNP are going to keep trying to persuade all the other opposition parties to coalesce around their plan that would keep the whole of the UK in the single market and the customs union. Sarah, thank you. So what kind of trade deals could Britain strike with other countries under the terms of Theresa May's Brexit deal? Last night, the US President Donald Trump said the current deal is good for the EU, but could prevent future trade deals between the UK and the US. Is he right? Our business editor, Simon Jack, is here to tell us. Simon. Well, he cast some doubt on whether we could continue trading with the US, and clearly that's not true. The first thing that's worth saying is that the UK already does a great deal of trade with the US. In fact, the US buys more UK goods and services than any other single country, around £100 billion pounds worth. Now, there's nearly double the amount that we sell to Germany, much more than France, much more than Ireland. Now, of course, that is still dwarfed by the amount we do with the EU in total, which is at 241 billion, so that's still our biggest trading partner. Now, there's no reason the existing trade with the US should suffer. What Mr. Trump may have meant is the PM's plan could make it more difficult to make a new trade deal with the US, and there he may have a bit of a point. Now, as you know, the UK is due to leave the EU at the end of March, but after that there will be this transition, a kind of status quo period, and uh, at least until December 2020. And in that time, we're part of the customs union, so very if not impossible, to do a new trade deal then. Thereafter, we may then trigger methane. So a cow came in, she was eating. Professor Chris Reynolds explains what they found. And she had five eructations, or five belches. So each spike is a burp, is it, effectively? It's a burp or a belch. There's a, been a huge increase in meat and milk consumption. Uh, that demand is going to continue, so I think we need uh, strategies for sustainably producing that meat and milk. 
One option is adding special supplements to the feed. Some of these make the cows a lot less gassy. So technically, it is possible to reduce the extraordinary amount of methane that cows produce. But on its own, that won't be enough to head off the worst of global warming. So it comes down to the key and highly controversial question of what we all choose to eat. Here at Manchester University, researchers study the climate cost of food. The fertilizers, tractors and processing all generate gases that cause more warming. So add all that up and these chocolates are responsible for up to 1.4 kilos of carbon dioxide and other gases. That's the equivalent of driving for 12 miles in a car. Producing this BLT sandwich involves a kilo of the gases. That's like driving for eight miles. And this serving of beef comes out top, creating more than three and a half kilos of warming gases. That's like a journey of 30 miles. We have got to reduce our carbon emissions across different sectors. And the food sector is absolutely paramount to that because we all eat and it has a significant contribution to our, not just the UK emissions, but globally. So we have to do something about it. And it won't be easy and it won't be popular. So what does this mean for our everyday shopping? Well, Mike Berners-Lee helps supermarkets to work out their climate costs. The differences are striking. So making the switch from beef and lamb down to um, plant-based proteins is uh, about one fiftieth of the carbon footprint. His advice is to eat more of this and to check if the produce is British and in season. Also to avoid fruit and veg that's been flown here. It's the tender stem broccoli that's come from Kenya and that will almost certainly have gone on an aeroplane. There are still some simple rules of thumb. So is it either in season or is it robust enough to have been able to travel from elsewhere in the world on a boat? Mike and other experts say they don't want to preach about low carbon food, but they say if we want to tackle climate change, we need to eat less of this. David Shookman, BBC News. The British academic freed from jail in the United Arab Emirates yesterday has arrived back in Britain. Matthew Hedges was welcomed home by his wife Daniela Tahada and members of his family. The Durham University PhD student was given a presidential pardon after being sentenced to life in prison just days earlier for spying for the British government. The Supreme Court has decided not to allow a terminally ill man permission to mount a final legal challenge to the law which prohibits assisted suicide. Noel Conway, who has motor neurone disease, wants a doctor to help him to die. Three Supreme Court judges refused permission to allow a full hearing of his appeal. Mr Conway said the decision was extremely disappointing. Women who get a degree gain more financially than men in the first few years of work, according to a new study. But some of that difference may be down to the fact women who don't go to university are more likely to do part-time or poorly paid work. The research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies also reveals that for around a third of men going to university, it initially makes very little difference to what they earn. Here's our education editor, Brown Jeffries. Sixth form is decision time university or not, what to study. So how much do future earnings matter? One of the main reasons I want to go into law is because I think lawyers get paid quite well and it sounds like it does sound really bad but I want to be able to go on lots of holidays. Do you think it's right to put the emphasis on how much you earn when you, you leave uni? I currently want to do uh, biology, specifically ecology and that's not really a very well paid job if you want to be like a field scientist. I want to make sure that I'm not just doing something for the sake of what other people think of what, how much money I get. I want to make sure I'm doing something that's beneficial for me. Some careers you don't need a degree for, and in that case you, you're probably better off getting experience in the workplace. Students will be able to compare similar subjects at different unis and work out what they might earn when they're 29. This data might be used by some six formers to help them make a decision. But ministers also want to use it to put pressure on universities around value for money. And that's because graduates who go on to earn less don't pay off all their loans. The taxpayer ends up picking up the bill. 
It's hard to simulate the future. Brighton University students can expect to do well. At age 29, their earnings on average 20% higher than non-graduates. Subjects like medicine and business do better than creative arts, and that worries university leaders. Creative industries are a, a real contribution to society and to me. Uh, many graduates in areas such as humanities and arts go on to do really great things in society and it's not always measured by the level of salary. So I would worry that this may have a, a, a negative impact. This axis represents one over the not all degrees have the same effect on earnings. For men, even more than women, choosing carefully can make all the difference. Bramwin Jeffries, BBC News, Brighton. Tributes have been paid to the Conservative peer, Lady Trumpington, who has died at the age of 96. She worked as a code breaker during the Second World War and went on to spend nearly four decades in the House of Lords. Colleagues have described the peer as one of a kind and an utter joy. Our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, looks back at her life. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Always in her place in the House of Lords, always the same. So lucky to be here. As David Cameron said, they just don't make politicians like that anymore. And he meant it. Wartime code breaker, oldest woman ever to be a government minister. And even, after a long life, a YouTube sensation. The grainy black and white photos tell of a colourful past. Land girl on the farm of former PM David Lloyd George during World War II, then a member of the near legendary code breaking team at Bletchley. Churchill visited us. He said, You are the birds that laid the golden eggs but never cackled. And that was the important thing, was that we never talked. Never conventional, though. Wife to a headmaster, one day fully clothed at the school pool. I jumped. And half the school jumped in with me to save me. And my husband wouldn't speak to me for three weeks. Why did you do it? Just for the hell of it. She was made a peer in 1980. Seemed proud of standing up to the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. We were really good friends, but if I didn't agree with her about something, I said so. And that was very good for her. She chain-smoked her way through several government departments, and then came fame, telling her tales on prime time TV. I've had to sign a piece of paper in order to be on this show to say I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> Why the fame, though? Well, watch this. And then the survivors of World War II started to look pretty old as well. As a Tory peer suggesting she was a revered relic of World War II and her silent reply. That picture went viral on YouTube. Complimentary tributes are normal. They're not always as warm as today's for Jean Trumpington. Baroness Trumpington, who has died at the age of 96. Time now for a look at the weather. Chris Fawkes is here. Chris. Hi, Sophie. Well, it's been the last of the really chilly days uh, today. We're seeing the weather turn significantly milder. We've had some fairly gusty winds around. You can see the seas getting up here in uh, Dawlish and Devon. And what's lurking down towards the southwest is the next area of low pressure that's waiting to steam in to bring some very strong winds our way into tomorrow. So more about that in just a moment. This is how we start off the evening. A band of rain clearing away from eastern Scotland, eastern England replaced by another one moving in from the west later in the night. Now between these two systems there might be a little bit of mist and fog over the hills for a time but ultimately as the winds pick up the fog will uh, improve and lift, the visibility will improve. Uh, it will be a milder night than we've seen of late. Temperatures typically around 7 or 8 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow this is our area of low pressure with tightly packed isobars targeting the western side of the country. Now, the strong winds will be with us quite quickly across western parts of England and Wales. Gusts of wind, 60 to 70 miles an hour. You can imagine some speed restrictions on the bridges there crossing the Severn. So, transport disruption, a possibility. Heavy rain moves across Northern Ireland into Scotland. Then the winds pick up. So, the winds arriving a little bit later in the day here, but still strong enough to cause some problems. And then for the Northern Isles, we'll see a number of showers here through the day. But the winds really don't get very, very strong until the night time when we could get gusts up to 70 or even 75 miles an hour. So it is going to be a stormy kind of day. One of those days where we could see some disruption, maybe power supplies affecting one or two areas. But it's going to be mild. Temperatures 11 to 15 degrees for most. 
On into Thursday's chart, another area of low pressure is moving in. Uncertain how deep this one's going to be. It's going to be another windy day with rain at times, but if that low pressure is a bit deeper, we could get gusts of wind of 70 or even 80 miles an hour, something we're keeping a very close eye on. But either way, it's an unsettled looking weather picture, and for most of us, the mild weather is here to say. Sophie. Chris, thank you. And that is all from the BBC News at 6. It's goodbye from me on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye bye. Our world is a unique series of films on the BBC. I want to be able to bring her home. Offering personal insights into global events. Our world. Stories that speak for themselves. Saturday and Sunday nights at 9.30 on the BBC News Channel. Join Simon McCoy as he brings you the top stories live. The ball is entirely in the UK's court. We could have got our tennis correspondent to report on this. The latest in sport. Heaven knows how they're dealing with this on the court. The heat or the wind? I'm not quite sure. Or both. <laughs> The day's weather. It's getting colder. And undeniable chemistry. He's still laughing. We have to talk to each other. Um, <laughs> but um... There's only one Simon. So you're the real McCoy. <laughs> Afternoon Live with Simon McCoy. Weekdays at 2pm on the BBC News Channel. Hello, good evening. This is BBC News with me, Julian Morica. Time for the latest headlines. 18 migrants, including a baby, have been rescued from two small boats in the English Channel as they tried to reach the UK. A bus company has been fined almost two and a half million pounds after one of its drivers crashed into a supermarket, killing two people. Theresa May has started her tour of the UK to sell the controversial Brexit deal, which has been widely criticised by MPs. Global efforts to tackle climate change are way off track, according to the UN, as it details the first rise in CO2 emissions in four years. And tributes have been paid to Baroness Trumpington, a wartime codebreaker and former minister who's died aged 96. Now, in a moment, it'll be time for Sports Day, but first, a look at what else is coming up this evening here on BBC News. As Theresa May continues her tour of the UK in a bid to sell her Brexit deal, we'll have the latest reaction. With a watchdog warning that police have been left to pick up the pieces amid a national crisis in mental health care, we'll speak to a victim's relative who thinks the authorities should be doing more. And we'll take a look at tomorrow's front pages in the papers at 10.40. With me will be the former Trade Minister, Lord Digby Jones, and the Guardian columnist, Dawn Foster. That's all ahead on BBC News, but now it's time for Sports Day. Hello, welcome along to Sports Day. I'm Sarah Mulcairn. Coming up, Manchester City. Juventus, Mourinho had to walk. United have relocated to the Hilton Hotel at Lancashire Cricket Ground, the other side of the stadium from where we are now, but no such problems tonight. Though, as you can see, the traffic behind us is intense. The Young Boys fans, 3,000 of them, walked from the city centre with a police escort, the Christmas markets, uh, some roadworks have mean that this city is in gridlock at the moment. But the important thing, as far as tonight's match goes, is that Manchester United are here. Their fans may take a bit longer, and Old Trafford is not sold out, which is quite unusual for tonight. So let's see how many are inside the ground at kickoff. David, in terms then of the performances on the pitch, how under pressure is Jose Mourinho and this side, particularly because they're at home tonight? Well, the draw against Crystal Palace at the weekend made this Manchester United's worst start to a season in 28 years. The pressure is building on Jose Mourinho. He isn't used to this sort of pressure in club football. Uh, Manchester United, uh, as Austin mentioned in his report, just three home wins this season. Uh, they've not won any of their Champions League games this season, not scored a goal. Manchester United have never failed to win four Champions League games at home in a row. They've never failed to score in Champions League games in a row. So 
there's some history to be avoided here tonight. But against young boys, they will certainly be hoping to uh, get back to winning ways. Of course, they beat them 3 0 in Switzerland. Their young boys are streaking clear by 16 points in the, at the top of the Swiss Super League. So Manchester United will hope for a convincing win tonight, which, as we know, when we look at the table, would take them through to uh, the knockout stages of this competition with a game to spare. So plenty for Manchester United to do, but they will be confident. Yeah, David, because when you mentioned that about the form in the Premier League and how it's going domestically, but Champions League, it's not been too bad. And when we think about that late comeback in Turin last week, they'll take an awful lot from that. They will. That really was one of the greatest, perhaps, performances Manchester United have produced in European competition, especially with the backdrop of Manchester United's form domestically. Certainly, European Champions League has become a uh, pleasant distraction, let's say, for Manchester United this season. And, of course, Juventus have been so uh, impressive at home and in European competition and in the Italian League with all those league titles. So United really would have taken confidence from that. It hasn't been replicated uh, in the Premier League. But hopefully for them, they will be able to continue that tonight and then move on to the uh, knockout stages, as I said, with a game to spare if Valencia uh, fail to win at Juventus, which many would say is fairly likely. It's an eight o'clock kickoff here at Old Trafford. Uh, Manchester United hoping for a morale-boosting victory. David Ornstein, live at Old Trafford for us. Thank you very much. Well, here are all the games then today. Two early group games in Group E. Ajax will be through if they beat Ake Athens. Currently goalless there. Uh, they do also need uh, Benfica to fail to win. And CSKA Moscow already a goal up against Victoria Pills. And, of course, uh, full details on the BBC website. Now elsewhere, Leicester host Southampton in their rearranged League Cup uh, fourth round tie tonight. That game, remember, was postponed following the helicopter crash that killed the club's owner and four other people at the end of October. Manager Claude Puel had said ahead of their 1-1 draw at Brighton on Saturday that it was time to try to move forward and to focus on football. Well, Mark Scott is there for BBC Five Live along with Michael Appleton. Yes, that's right. Leicester City up against Southampton for a place in the quarterfinals against Manchester City. Michael Appleton's alongside me uh, for Radio 5 Live Sports Extra. Michael, um, looking at Southampton, first of all, Mark Hughes under a bit of pressure. Is this a game you can win the fans back round with, or is it an unwelcome distraction from the Premier League? I'm sure he'll look at it thinking that it's an opportunity for him to get a win under his belt. Uh, obviously, he's had a difficult time in the league. There's a lot of speculation around his obviously job. Um, I'm sure... The attitude will be sort of going into the game, trying to get a win, get a little bit of momentum. I know they've got a big game on, uh, at the weekend against Man United. Obviously, they're not in fantastic form at the minute. They've got to play this evening in the Champions League. I'm sure that'll be his thoughts going into it. Looking at Leicester as well, big opportunity for them to get into the last eight of the competition. Do you think Claude Puel needs that? Um, I'm not sure really. Obviously, there's always speculation around uh, managers in the Premier League. Um, I think obviously they're in a, in a position at the minute where the mid-table and they're quite secure. It's a cup competition that was good to us last year. You know, obviously going out in the quarterfinals and an opportunity again to put uh, a few wrongs right um, to in, in, in compared to what happened last season. Top man, thanks very much, Michael. As I mentioned, full commentary on the game for you on Five Live Sports Extra and the BBC website. Yes, and this is where you can follow that as well as all the Champions League action and some big games in the Championship and the Football League with five live final score on the BBC iPlayer, the BBC Sport app or via your red button from 7pm. Well, also coming up in the programme, former England defender Saul Campbell has made his first steps into management after taking over at Macclesfield Town. You're watching BBC News. Scientists at NASA say they're beginning to gather data from Mars after successfully landing a probe on the surface of the planet yesterday. The InSight spacecraft has already begun to send its first images back. Our science reporter, Victoria Gill, sent this report from Mission Control in California. Touchdown confirmed. <laughs> 
Relief and joy at mission control. After plunging through the Martian atmosphere at six times the speed of a bullet, NASA's InSight spacecraft safely planted its feet on the surface of Mars. Now the science begins. It's going to be a really busy uh, two or three months for us. I'm really hoping that the energy I'm feeling today is going to carry me through those, uh, those next few months because it's going to be needed. Uh, but, you know, the first, when we get our first Mars quake, we're going to get a bunch of images over in the next few days. And it's just incredible to be on this mission and to say, now tomorrow when I come on shift, I'm going to see an image of Mars that no one has ever seen before. And it's already sending snapshots back to Earth. InSight's cameras will examine its surroundings in detail so scientists can select exactly where to place its scientific equipment. It'll listen for Martian earthquakes and drill deep into the planet to study its inner structure. As the InSight lander studies the deep interior of Mars robotics, its data back here to Mission Control at NASA in California. And the people here will use that data to work out exactly how rocky worlds like Earth, Mars and the Moon actually formed four and a half billion years ago. They lovingly call this the centre of the universe. The two-year mission is now underway to build a picture of the hidden depths of the red planet. Victoria Gill, BBC News and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California. Well, Dr. Rain Urshad, a researcher at the Science and Technology Facilities Council, worked on the NASA Mars InSight mission and explained what exactly the spacecraft was looking for. There are a vast range of questions about the universe. The one that everyone wants to know is, is there life outside of the Earth? And we suspect that there isn't life on the surface of Mars, but we may well find it below the surface. So Mars at one stage had a magnetic field, which would have been on Earth, it's the result of movements in a molten iron core. That's one of the things we want to measure with the instruments that we have. That magnetic field is what holds our atmosphere in place. So it allows that atmosphere to keep us warm, it protects us from the radiation from the sun, it gives us lovely warm temperatures and liquid water, all of the things that are needed for life to flourish. At some point, Mars lost its atmosphere. It lost the magnetic field that kept it safe, and the solar wind slowly allowed it to drift away, which meant the temperatures on the surface rose. It became bombarded with radiation, and that's why we think we haven't found life on the surface of Mars. But there is still the possibility that that life retreated below the surface. So that's one of the questions we're hoping to answer. I was part of the UK team. The UK instrument is a miniature seismometer that's incredibly sensitive. In the next few weeks, the lander is going to determine exactly where on the surface to place that seismometer. And once it's there, we're going to be feeling the first vibrations that anyone has ever felt on the surface of another planet. We're hoping that we'll be able to sense Mars quakes and ideally impacts from meteorites as well. We don't know what the structure of Mars is. So those vibrations might be coming from shifts in tectonic plates or more likely in stresses and pressures in the crust, the top surface of the planet. But we'll absolutely feel vibrations coming from meteorite impacts all over the planet. And each one illuminates the inside of the planet for us. Food for thought from Dr. Rain Ursh. Well, now it's time for a look at the weather forecast with Ben Rich. Good evening. Today brought us not one, but two different faces of autumn. We started off with some fog that caused a little bit of disruption, and then it turned wet. It also started to turn windy. This was the scene for a weather watcher in County Down a little bit earlier on. It's all because low pressure has taken charge of the scene. One band of rain that moved its way through today, another to come later on tonight. And as this low deepens tomorrow, is going to be a particularly windy day. We're likely to see gales, particularly in the west. That, combined with more heavy rain, is likely to cause some travel disruption. Your BBC local radio station will keep you up to date. So here's our first band of rain clearing away from eastern areas. More rain returning to the southwest. In between, it may just turn calm enough for the odd mist and fog patch. We're not expecting a foggy night uh, like last night. And temperatures all the while creeping upwards 10 degrees, the overnight low there in Plymouth. So into tomorrow, this first band of rain pushes northeastwards, then a slightly drier slot, and then some more heavy rain pushes in across Northern Ireland and southern Scotland. Over some of the hills of southern and central Scotland could see 50 millimetres of rain. It is going to be a mild day. Temperatures 
higher than we've seen for quite some time, 12 to 14 degrees. But it will also be windy. Now, first of all, we'll see very strong winds for western coasts, 50, 60, 65 mile per hour wind gusts. And then later in the day, the strongest of the winds transfer towards the northeast of Scotland. Could see gusts in excess of 70 miles per hour here. And as we go through Wednesday, well, it's not over yet because we